All right, so in this Bible study, uh, we're going to be talking about some pretty touchy subjects, subjects that are um, pretty prevalent in our world today, and as Pastor Brian has said, is starting to seep into the church. Um, Of course, they're very um, touchy subjects. They're very uh, subjects that can make people very offensive, but they're relevant, and they need to be addressed, especially in the church. Uh, Scripture talks about them. And we as Christians need to talk, them out, talk about them as well. Now, throughout this Bible study and the three going on, I want you to please speak your mind about these issues. I'm going to be asking you a few questions, and I expect you guys to please participate with me and think with me throughout this, uh, throughout this Bible study. Um, we really need your recommendation, your, your opinions, and, and your participation here. Now, if you would look into the notes that you would most likely have gotten already, uh, look at the very first page. What we're going to be looking at is a MLK 50 sermon, which is basically an event that happened about a year ago in April, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the, um, I believe it was the death of Martin Luther King Jr., And throughout this event, there were multiple sermons given by uh, Reformed pastors and pretty uh, reputable pastors about the relationship of uh, race and the church and and justice and social justice and things of that nature. Now, this particular sermon and these particular quotes that are made in your documents were given by a pastor that I greatly honor and respect. I won't name him or his church to uh, protect the guilty. This pastor, however, seems to be working under a particular worldview and a concept of justice. Pay attention to how he talks throughout this entire sermon. Um, let's, let's look at these notes with me. He says, quote, I am the pastor of a, name redacted, church, who is, which is a predominantly white church. I won't apologize for that. It's just the reality of God's call on my life. And then he continues to address these people he calls fools. He says, quote, I don't hate my people. I just hate fools. I'm not talking to them tonight. 300 fools left when we first broached the subject of racial justice. And there was no lament in our leaders about it. He then goes to describe uh, what, he's, what he calls his problems. Quote, if I preach the sermon out of the book of Isaiah on justice, my inbox would fill with glee that I would approach the subject. But if I applied the subject to race, then all of a sudden I was a Marxist or I've been watching too much of the liberal media. He then says there is nothing about how the majority of white men and women are educated that would lead us to believe that Africans and African-Americans are intellectual, innovative or creative except a couple of y'all in sports or entertainment. He also says that some whites are, quote unquote, ignorant of this and are, quote, part of a system that encourages their ignorance. He says this is unjust. Pay attention as I read this over again. He says that some whites are ignorant of this problem and are, quote, part of a system that encourages their ignorance. This is unjust. He then proposes a few solutions to this problem. He says, I'm not asking you to find the black person that agrees with you. It, or in their agreeing with you, probably has that African-American trying to get approval or position. He says that textbooks must first be revived, revised and structures must change. The way of life must be changed. Legitimate seats at the table with real power and voice must be called out and deployed. I mean, and developed. There must be space for voices to be heard without fear or repercussion. This means we do not want to put on events where Anglo communicators outweigh people of color. What that means is saying that he's trying to create an environment to where whites aren't the majority of the speaking, uh, speaking people in that event. He then goes on to say, and this is one of the things that really bothers me. He says, quote, one of the firms that are helping us find men for ministry in our churches asked me this, quote, if we, want to f- if we find an Anglo 8 and an African American 7, which one do you want? I said, give me the African American 7. He then asked me, 
what if I find an Anglo 8 and an African American 6? I said, give me the Anglo 8, because the black 6 will look and feel like the kind of tokenism I'm preaching against. He says as well, it is an, he says that it is an opportunity to find and give power away. Let me repeat that so that it remains in your hearing, because this is very important. He says, it's another opportunity to find and give power away. So I want you guys to give me a little bit of feedback on what you just heard. How does he view those who disagree with him? Exactly. He calls them fools. He really doesn't care about them, especially when they leave. Now, the second question, what is the particular problem that he notices? Exactly. There is, a, there is a large amount of ignorance in relation to whites in churches, and as well as there, there seems to be a bit of a deficit between how people view the intellectual authority of black people. And the reason why is that, mo is that in many speaking events, there aren't very many black people in these particular spaces. Now, let me ask you this. Is this a valid problem? Is the valid problem that there's an imbalance? Yes. Mere, is, is the mere presence of an imbalance between <coughs> black speakers and white speakers a problem? No. Exactly. I like playing the NBA. Mm -hmm. right? and, but I'm too old, I'm too slow, I can't jump, and my jump shot's not good enough. I can't say, look, the NBA is racist because 80% of the players who are there are black. That's not why they're there. They're there because they're the best basketball players on the planet. Exactly. That's incredibly true. And that's, that's really one of the things that we're going to be touching on um, throughout this entire Bible study, and especially in this one. Um, let's see. Question three. How does he think the problems that he poses will be solved in his own, uh, in his own life and in his own way? What does he propose to be the solution to his problems? Exactly. Not, not what they are. Yeah, it's 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 basically well, one of the things that we've been talking about, especially with with me and the pastors, is something called um, it, it's favoritism, affirmative action, basically choosing people for specific positions simply because of the color of their skin. The only re the reason that he, he chooses this is because he sees a deficit in, in relation to skin color, and he says that solu the solution is basically to uh, put more black people in power, basically to find and give power away. Now, what do you, what do you think about this solution? Is it, is it right, is it wrong, is it just, or is it unjust? It's unjust. Right, it's, in, in the Christian perspective, I would say, and as I, I intend to prove in this Bible study, it is unjust. Now, how, how does he understand justice to me? What, in what particular perspective does this pastor define justice? Yes, by, by basically making everything equal in relation to power. Basically, his version of justice is because there are a predominantly white, basically there is a, a white majority, then justice is giving power to where both blacks and whites have equal majority. But the question is, how do you do it? It's basically giving power from one person and, t and taking power from one person and giving it to another. So, my friends, this is how this pastor defines justice. He even says later in this sermon that this is a gospel issue. He says that the way he's doing this is in, is in lockstep with the gospel. And this is the type of worldview that we're facing in our world today. 
But what exactly is this worldview? What do we call it, and how do we respond? As we go through this entire Bible study, let's see what Scripture has to say. But first, let's pray about it. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for gathering us together so that we might study your word and and provide an answer to what society has to say. Lord, we live in a day and age where people want to live on their own and people have their own concept of justice. But Lord, we, we realize that justice and righteousness is the foundation of your throne and that you demand justice. So Lord, we must be able to get this right. And so, Father, give me the words to speak. Give me the Give me the bravery, give me the strength to be able to proclaim your word with boldness. And so everyone will know that you are God and that we are your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in order to, in order to understand this issue, we really need to define two things. What is worldly justice and what is biblical justice? And the first thing we need to realize, the first thing we really need to define is worldly justice. So, my friends, how do you think the world defines justice? Depends on how you're doing the defining. That's true. That's very, that's very much true. In, in, in some cases, justice really depends on the person. Um, whether, whether something is right for me, it's, it's just for me. And if it's just for you, then go ahead. But um, specifically, when we, when we look at the definitions of the world's justice. Has anyone ever heard of social justice? How how do you think that how do you think social justice is defined by the world today? Yeah, ba- basically, for in their perspective, equality. But per- particularly, what does justice, social justice, really mean? Because as, as the way the world seems to say it is, it's, it's basically just equality between men and women, the races, the sexes, everything. But to quote the famous speaker, um, in Diego Montoya, <laughs> you keep saying that word, but I don't think it means what you think it means. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> Andre the Giant, that's even better. <laughs> um, and so we, what we really need to do is define social justice. And one of the, one of the things that really strikes me is that uh, Josh Bice, a Reformed, a Reformed Baptist pastor and uh, really one of the big speakers in this, um, in, in, against social justice, says that, quote, unquote, social justice is the biggest threat to the Church of Jesus Christ in the last 100 years. And I'm inclined to believe him. Why do I believe that? Simply look at the dictionary definition of social justice. And what is it? The dictionary defines it as, quote, justice in terms of, listen to this, the redistribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Let me repeat that. It's justice in the terms of redistribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. For example, look at the subjects of, e- uh, of income inequality. When a person looks at basically when one person is making more money than another, what you have to do in order to make that just is basically take money from the person who is making more money and give it to the person who has less. And so social justice is the solution to the problems proposed by something known as critical theory. Social justice is basically the application or putting into practice of this particular worldview. And critical theory is basically the worldview that divides the world into two groups. You're either this or this. You're either an oppressor, someone who harms another group, or the oppressed and their allies or the people who work with them. You're either someone who harms a person or the person who is harmed. And therefore, success and wealth are a result of illegitimate or wrongfully gained privilege, unless that person is part of an oppressed group. Let me give you an example. Imagine a white person from Appalachia who was born in poverty and climbs to the top of the board's 
because of hard work, dedication, and doing the right thing. He gains his money by giving to charity, by working hard, by, by trying hard for his wages, and, and everything like that. Is this person privileged or, or, or not privileged? Not. Yeah, exactly. But in the, world, in the worldview of critical theory, it doesn't matter if he's worked hard or whether he's done everything right. He would be called privileged because he is a white person who has a lot of money and simply because of that. But Colin Powell's child, who was born in prestige and power, how would, he, how would that person be viewed in the eyes of critical theory? As oppressed and disadvantaged. Exactly. He w- they would be oppressed and disadvantaged simply because of the color of their skin. They would be, quote, an oppressed group. And so all the money and power that Colin's Pow- Colin Powell's child would have because he's born with it, that would be viewed as legitimate power and legitimate privilege and le- legitimate prestige. While the white person who worked his way up, no matter if he did it everything right, is still illegitimate. He doesn't deserve any of that, and all of that money should be calling Powell's kids. And so critical theory focuses on four four specific goals, and it's maintained through four specific steps. It's basically, you, you have to do four things. One is identify oppressed groups, and those groups are defined in relation to your race, your color of your skin, your gender or, or your sex, your religion, or your sexuality. The second step is to assess group outcomes or basically find a problem within these groups. If there's any problem, identify that and make sure everybody knows it. And the third thing is, once you have a problem, assign blame for those outcomes. Of course, since that the problem is happening within an oppressed group, that means an oppressor is oppressing them. And so the only thing you really need to do is just find the oppressor. And the fourth thing in order to, after you've done that, is proclaim the need for redistribution of power and resources from those who unjustly have them and to those who don't. So the only thing you have to do is find a problem, find someone to blame, and have them redistribute their power. And one of the biggest examples of this is the group of Faithful America. All you need to do is basically look at the bottom of the second page in your, uh, in your notes. This describes the organization known as Faithful America. They say, quote, we are the largest online community of Christians. Christians, they say, putting faith into action for social justice. And let's look at what they claim are its biggest victories for social justice. Number one, they fought back against Hobby Lobby. After Hobby Lobby filed a lawsuit claiming a religious objection to providing insurance coverage for contraception, basically the the morning after pill and, and stuff like that, we delivered tens of thousands of petition signatures to their corporate headquarters in Oklahoma City. Our spokesperson was a local evangelical pastor who has dramatically turned away from corporate security resulting in one of the earliest national media coverages uh, demonstrating Christian opposition to the quote-unquote religious freedom attack on birth control. Later, we held a vigil outside of Hobby Lobby corporate headquarters the night after the Supreme Court announced this decision in their case. Basically, they're, they're celebrating the fact that they fought back against Hobby Lobby's stance against contraception and its stance on abortion. The second, well... Let's skip the second and go to uh, the third. Defended, they defended an unjustly defrocked pastor. Pennsylvania United Methodist pastor, we were just talking about the United Methodist, Frank Schaefer was put on trial and defrocked for officiating at the wedding of his gay son. But after local Methodists made headlines with a petition signed by 35,000 Faithful America members, His bishop publicly committed to do everything in her power, her power, to prevent future trials, helping prompt other bishops to make the same promise. Quote, or or parentheses, Schaefer's defrocting was ultimately overturned on appeal. This is what they see as justice. 
And lastly, they help students win justice for a fired principal. When hundreds of students walked out of class to protest the firing of a gay vice principal at the Seattle area Catholic high school, we amplified their message with 20,000 petition signatures delivered to the archbishop's doorstep. This is at his home. Within days of the school's president, the school's president resigned, even while a lesbian teacher came out and kept her job, send, sending a potent message to Catholic schools worldwide. Basically, their view of justice is taking an official homosexual defrocked pastor or, or defrocked teacher back into the school when he was completely denied service because he, he violated Catholic rules. But apparently that doesn't matter because he is part of an oppressed group and therefore putting him back in his position is justice. So this organization clearly acts on social justice in order to achieve their goals. They really understand what the term means, though they call themselves a Christian organization. What they do, as we have seen, promotes unbiblical practices. So is this how Christians are supposed to view the world? How are we, as Christians, supposed to view actual justice? Let's look at Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, in order to understand that. Matt, uh, Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, what Balak king of Moab devised and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with cows of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams and with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give the firstborn of my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness or mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Here, God is bringing an indictment against Israel. They have been unjust and God refuses to accept their sacrifices. One of, these, one of the things that I really want to point out here first and foremost is that God, being God, demands justice. And when we are unjust, he is unhappy with our worship. Please keep that in mind as we go through this. Therefore, God requires three things from us. One, to do justice. Number two, to love mercy. And number three, to walk humbly with our God. But first, how, do, how does a person do justice? The text doesn't say here, but he does say elsewhere. God's law lays it out in very clear ways. Let's, let's hear Leviticus 19 verses 11 and 18 in your hearing. You don't have to turn to it. Just, just listen here. Starting at verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of the Lord, your God. I am the Lord. Verse 13, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You shall not do, do injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. I am the Lord. So, let's look at verses 11 and 12. How does one do justice in relation to these verses? Well, Scripture obviously says to not lie and to not bear false witness. No matter how hard or matter how good it would help our own positions, we should never lie about anyone, even for, their, even for our own reputation. And our shorter catechism really testifies to this. Just all, just all you need to do is just listen to question 76 through 78. Question, what is the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment is, you shall ne- not bear false witness against your neighbor. What is required in the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man, and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. And question 78, what is forbidden in the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment forbids whatever is prejudicial to truth or injurious to our neighbor's good name. In order to do justice against our neighbor and not lying to them, we should protect their good name. Verse 13 defines justice as not robbing someone. And how does this passage define robbery? Holding a person's due wage. Now, one thing I want to ask everyone is, what is a due wage? That is true. It could be truth. And in relation to in relation to a job and having a person's in giving a person's due wage, how does one define what a way, what is a due wage? Something that is agreed upon by both parties. Exactly. <laughs> Something that is agreed upon by both parties. If I go into a job and it's, I, I had to um, do this is when I was talking with the pastors about my own wage and, and being an intern. When I walked into my pastor's office and we talked about the wages that I was going to get, we, I, we had to agree on a particular wage that I was going to get in order to pay for my food, pay for my apartment, pay for rent. And if that wage is agreed upon and I get less than what was promised to me, that's unjust. But, I, but if I get more than what is due to me, that's a blessing. That's what's called mercy. But in relation to what scripture is saying here, in relation to justice, I need to get what I agreed upon. And so verses 15 and 16 continues on and says that justice is done through not doing injustice or showing favoritism. Pay very close attention to verse 15 because this is really the heart of our issue here. Quote, you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You see, this is the exact opposite of what we see in the world. What the world wants us to do is to favor one side over the other, to favor the oppressed side and to favor the oppressed side and disenfranchise the oppressor side. But scripture puts everybody on an equal plane when it comes to justice. Everyone is just everyone is equally unjust at the foot of the cross. Justice means that we treat people fairly by giving them their due, to refuse to place one one in position over another and to instead love each other equally. Now this goes to the second point. What what does it mean to love mercy? We see from, from Micah that justice is distinct from mercy, but God requires us to do both. Listen to what scripture says in Isaiah chapter 58, verses three through 10. Verse three, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, on the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all of your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such is such the fast that I chose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I chose to loose the bonds of the wicked and undo the straps of the yoke to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing finger and spreading wickedness. If you pour out for the hungry and satisfy, satisfy the desire of the, of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. Of course, we see in Isaiah that Isaiah does talk about doing justice in verse six. And what does that require? Freeing the bonds of slavery and being, and being just to the unjust. But scripture also calls us to perform acts of mercy. One of them is to feed the hungry. Number two, to help the homeless. And three, to clothe the naked. So how does the church do justice and how do we, or how does the church do mercy and how do we do mercy? Do we not often go out and feed the hungry? Do we not go out and help the less fortunate? Does not our tithes and offerings help go out and feed the less fortunate? What exactly do we call that? We call it mercy ministry. That's the reason why we call it that, because it is the biblical definition of mercy. And so in conclusion, the third thing that God requires of us is to walk humbly with our God. He calls us to fully live before him. Now, how do we walk humbly before God? We do that by obeying him and advocating what he calls for. When God calls for justice, we advocate justice. And when God calls for mercy, we advocate and do mercy. This means recognizing the misguided perspective of the world. This is what we're required to do. And this is what I'm doing and helping you guys do today to recognize the worldview that the worldview that the world has. Pay attention to the things that they're saying. In many cases, the world, the world has taken this worldview by storm and the church has been asleep. As our pastors have said, they didn't know this for a few months until I had to bring it up to them. And I didn't know it until I was in college. Also, understand that though the advocates of social justice speak of unbiblical things, many of them, especially the Christians, are trying to care about people and trying to love what they see are the oppressed. They know that injustice is sin, and we do too. Remember what we all thought was the world's definition of justice, equality. And we could agree with that. We really could. But the way that they're going about it is completely misguided and completely unbiblical. And the church has the responsibility to say, you're on the right track. You have the right ideas, but you're going through it in the most terrible way that would lead you to destruction. The third, and this helps with this, is to respond to this worldview with the gospel. The gospel is the only solution to the world's problem with injustice. We need to tell people that all men of every stripe of every race, of every gender, of every sexuality, are sinners and deserve the wrath of God in hell. But Christ came, he lived, he died, and he rose for sinners of every stripe, of every creed, and of every nation. And the life that he gives can right even the most heinous of wrongs. And therefore, we don't show favoritism because God didn't when he chose us for his own glory. And we show mercy because he has shown mercy to us. My friends, the gospel of grace is sufficient to answer all of our calls for justice. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for giving your son who is the answer to all of our cries for justice. Lord, we know that if you were fully just, we all would not be here right now. But Father, we thank you for grace and mercy because it stops the hand of your wrath and instead gives us your son who took the penalty for us. And if we only trust in you, we will be made righteous. 
And Father God, in response, let us go out into the world and show the world what justice and mercy truly is. Let call us, Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may do right to our neighbor and also show mercy to the less fortunate, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit those who are in jail. Because you said in your word that the, if we did these to the least of these, we did the same to you. Father, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jeremiah, let me keep you for a little bit longer. Up there. Sure. Um, can you give us um, just a, a two, maybe three sentence definition of number one, critical theory, and number two, social justice? I know you've covered that. Yeah. But I think it would be helpful. It's helpful to me um, because I have to keep coming back to that. Yeah, of course. Um, critical theory is basically the worldview that sees the world in oppressor and oppressed. Okay, that's critical theory. Mm -hmm. And social justice is basically showing favoritism to the oppressed and against the oppressor group. And that's, that's basically it. Showing favor and giving power to the oppressed. Okay, and I don't want to get ahead of you... Um, in your in what's coming up in the weeks to come. So oh, don't, I'm don't to say I'm going to cover that later. Don't worry about but it. What is um, how is that been seen to bleed into the church and even to the point where where Christians don't realize that that's what they're promoting. That's what they're doing. Yeah, um, one of the things that has really practically developed into a movement these years, these, these past few months, is something called the woke church, where basically the, the, person, the person who is in the woke church has awoken to the situation that an oppressed group is in, whether it's um, black people in relation to how they've suffered from slavery or women in positions in the church or uh, homosexuals in relation to their, their stance or their positions in relation to sin and judgment. And so what the woke church does is tries to place men uh, in relation to race, place black men in spirits of, in positions of power simply because they're um, simply because they're black, put women in positions of power simply because they're women, and as Pastor Brian has said, accept the notion of a gay Christian, where a person can be openly homosexual and yet still be qualified as a Christian. Brian, would you make would you make your statement a little more clear maybe about the the term gay term. Christian using Yeah, gay Christian when none of us would have a problem. I, I trust, I hope, that none of us would have an issue with a Christian saying, I struggle against the temptation, against the sin of, of being attracted to the same sex, the same gender. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's my struggle. It's my besetting struggle. I will probably struggle with this for the rest of my life, but I am, thanks be God, I am, I am being sanctified. That is, There's, that is the basic stance of how the church, how the conservative church has viewed the subject of a repentant Christian right. in, in relation to anything, whether it's homosexuality, anger, theft, any sin. And so the, the difference then, Tom, being that a person who stands up and says, I am a same-sex attracted Christian, or I am a gay Christian, or I am a homosexual Christian, I'm a lesbian Christian, whatever you want to say, put any other sin in front of it. <clears throat> that they are giving themselves the identity of this being something that is who they are. Biologically, um, that's who God made them to be. So, so that they are not at fault. The fault is only in the practice. They have to, they have to resist the sin um, but but the practice is what is the sin, not the identity. The problem is these people don't have their own identities and they don't really 
want to. Exactly. They, they, they are victims, and without the victim identity or mentality, they don't have an identity. Yep, yep, so, e- exactly. That's it's a... Not, it's a complete denial of, of God's identity for them, and in, especially in relation to the gay Christian movement, is a denial of what I said in my very first sermon when I preached on 1 Corinthians 6. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's a denial of Christ's identity and says that I get to identify myself. God is not God, it's me. Yeah, I was looking at this checklist. It looks like a checklist I wrote down. It looks like part of God's checklist. It says, what is social justice? And then focuses on four specific goals. I mean, these people that dole out social justice, who appoints them to the social court? Exactly. You know, do, they, do they think they're worldly gods? Because I, you know, I saw that movie, um, Bruce Almighty, where Jim Carrey became... <laughs> God yep. said, okay, here you go if you want my... And then the email or the, the prayer started coming in and he couldn't handle it. So these people... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a slippery slope. As we will see, it's, it's going to fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Alan? So I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Mm-hmm. Are you saying that there's no such thing as oppression? No. I mean, can you give us some examples of real oppression with regard to... Maybe race, or maybe with regard to the genders. Maybe. It, well, one of the, one of the things that I can I can truly say, in relation to oppression, is what's going on in the Middle East, because, of course, Scripture does not take homosexuality lightly. Lightly, but the Islamic government is taking homosexual and throw, take hom- taking homosexuals and throwing them off buildings. It's not allowing women to drive. In their legal, in their legal proceedings, a voice, two, vo- two women's testimony is only equal to one of a man's. A woman's, vote, a woman's vote is only half of a man's. That, I can truly say, is oppression and needs to be dealt with. And it is not you, through... You term that social injustice? Yes, social injustice. I would... I, even, even then, I would fully define it as injustice on a social level, but I wouldn't define it as social justice because social justice has a particular definition that we should not use. <clears throat> when you say you're against social justice, I mean, so does that mean that you're against justice? You think ju- justice Christians shouldn't care about that? No, of course not. As I said before, justice is the foundation of God's throne, and God demands justice. The question is, are you define, is, is how you're defining social justice. Because social justice, by definition, means the redistribution of wealth and power from oppressor groups to oppressed groups. And that's not what Scripture calls for. Scripture calls for doing things fairly. Social justice in the everyday sense of the term. Social justice, though, has become a, a quote, unquote, particular kind of movement. Exactly. Right. So we're right. opposed to it. We should, we should be in favor of social justice in the everyday sense of that term. We should be opposed to social justice in the sense that it's become a title for a movement. Yes. I, I, I distinguish it between, I distinguish it all the time between the concept of equality and the subject and the concept of equity. Equality is everybody has an equal opportunity in order to get the things that they want. Equity is sameness. Basically, you are made in the exact same way. There is no difference between you. God has not made you to differ. That is a complete denial in social justice. They completely deny that God makes men to differ and that everybody must be the exact same or else you are the oppressor. And that's not what scripture calls for. I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'll play Brian's advocate. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, is there a point, do you think, that there ever was a point? And, and here, this is, this, I'm asking for your opinion now. Yeah. This is not a right or wrong answer. Yeah. Was there ever a point for... Um, what's it called? Affirmative action. Was there ever a point where it was right 
Hmm. Historically. I would say that, I mean, before it was called affirmative action, where it was simply giving, I mean, even in the, um, probably after the civil rights era and after basically the civil war where blacks had the opportunity to go into places where they didn't have to. I mean, where they, they absolutely couldn't where they finally had the right to vote, they were finally able to get into positions of power, but they worked their way there. They weren't simply handed it out simply because of who they were. And there was even some help given to those who, who couldn't, but they worked for it. Okay. Wouldn't you say, though, uh, again, I'm asking for your opinion. Yeah. And, and by the way, folks, I'm at, in case y'all didn't notice, Jeremiah is black. Uh, <laughs> Nobody knew. <laughs> and, and so it's a, it, is a, it is a very, um, uh, and I love it, um, because you know, this, is, this can be a very intimidating environment, even for a white guy. Um, but but this, if there is, a, there is a, a view of things historically that when the Emancipation Proclamation and the uh, post-civil rights movement, that there was a period of time in which there was intentional um, movement to pay the black man who came to work, much less knowing that he couldn't get any more anywhere else. Yeah in order to keep him into that, um, into that dependence. Yeah. And, and in the post, you know, civil rights period, or right before the civil rights period, um, there was the same kind of thing that was yeah. proven to still be going on. So I guess my question is, because it's not, I don't think it's an easy answer. Mm. Um, how much of that uh, needed to be something that was legislated. Yeah. And that, how much of it needed to be something that was simply corrected by virtue of time? Yeah. That, I mean, like you said, that is a very big question. That takes a lot of thought, but it also took, I mean, everything in relation to the civil rights movement, to slavery, and things like that weren't fixed within a day. And in some cases, it did take government interference to say, hey, you can't do this anymore. This is unjust. And in some cases, it was a good, it was a good thing to have that happen. But in other cases, especially to where we've gotten to now, the government, the federal government has abused its use in order to promote justice because of the people who have been placed in power. Once you have a flawed view of justice, everything, including and especially the federal government, will be used as a tool in order to promote your ends. Whether they were originally good and have been turned into bad or have been bad from the start. If that leads me to my next question, I realize I'm, I've held you till the end of time. <laughs> you are, you but, are fine. But this, this, is the, um, this leads right into what you were saying in regard to um, you know Colin Powell's son versus the uh, Anglo man who's worked his way up out of poverty into a, to a very empowered wealthy individual, um, how at what point does the individual Anglo become the oppressed? And the African American male become the oppressor. In relation to critical Does theory, that ever happen? Yeah, in in in, in no. base relation to critical no. theory, no. right when he's born. Say because that. in in basis of critical theory, right when he's born, because I he still didn't understand. Yeah, that. in base of critical theory, right when he's born, because he's born right within an oppressor class. But as he grows in, in money and power, that sort of oppression, I mean, that sort of privilege gets louder and louder for everybody to notice. Yeah. So he has always been part of an oppressor class. 
It's only when he actually has power that he, everybody finally recognizes it. But in critical theory, the, the, the majority class can never be oppressed. Yep. They can never be oppressed. Yep. They can, they can never be oppressed. They're only oppressors. Yep. And minorities can never be oppressors. They can only be oppressed. Yep, that's one of the things that I'm that I'm going to be talking about in uh, in part four at the end of the month. Basically, the oppressor class, especially in relation to race, whites are always racist, and blacks can never be racist. And I am going to provide multiple, multiple, multiple examples of that fact. Okay, and, and I'm smiling because we've had these conversations at ad nauseum, but you. I mean, you've made this point, we've, we've talked about this, but the, the situation then is where it is to your advantage to find a way to find yourself as a member of an oppressed class. You have to be a victim. Yeah, you, you a, have to be. Because, and that's exactly where we are in our country. Yep. yep. Everybody's a victim. This is everybody except the white male. Yep. Right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. In in social science classes, in in my social science classes, because I I, I just graduated, thank God. <laughs> but um, in my cultural anthropology classes, we learned that something known as as social ethnicity and intersectionality. It is politically advantageous for you to be part of an oppressed class, especially in, in something called intersectionality. If you top multiple oppressed classes upon yourself, then you have greater political advantage. Uh, because, of course, there, it's, it's all on a scale. Because on the bottom, you have straight white men, which is always on the bottom and will always be on the bottom in critical theory. But as you go up, as you go to a white woman, a black woman, a black lesbian woman, a black trans woman, a black trans female Muslim, you get as, as high on the oppression scale as you get, you get more political power and therefore you have a better, have a better say. So that, that worldview is, is as... It is. So how does the gospel address this in two sentences? The gospel puts everybody on equal footing under the cross. You're all sinners, and you all need a Savior. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Y'all be blessed.